presenting, ladies and gentlemen. Hard Boyle Haggerty in the ring now. Today's the heyday of the pretty boy. Kowalski is called killer for Dr. Gene Stanley of Chicago. She likes it. Oh, boy, that can hurt. Right here at ringside while we go in for a riot of rough house that's finally called wrestling. I have seven brothers and five sisters. My father at that time was a sergeant of detectives in the Montreal Police Force. He was born in Alexandria, Ontario. And my mother, whose maiden name was Picard, she was born in Montreal. Her side of the family, the Picards, were actually descendants of, of the French royal family, the Picards. So I could claim if I wanted to, this, uh, to be a descendant of the, 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 the French kings, but I'd rather not. <laughs> Building uh, snow, snow forts, and we lived, we lived at that time in, the, in, the, in Montreal, and they, they used to gather all the snow in those days and, and pile it at the, at, the, at the end of the street. My three eldest brothers, Marcel, Maurice, and Guy, they used to build forts in there and tunnels, and they would tunnel and come out on the other side, and they would actually catch uh, English-speaking kids and make them prisoners in that fort. <laughs> when I was about five, six years old, my father I was traveling around, and my father had the unmarked uh, police car, and uh, it was a one-way radio that they would get messages from, uh, from the, the dispatcher in the police force, and they, he got this one message. They said, Ferdinand Vachon, agent such and such, you got a report at this big dance hall, and they, they were having a, a, a big fight in there, a riot, and my father said, okay, and he says, well, I don't have time to take you home, you're gonna stay in the car. And he stopped and picked up his partner, who was Euclid Jeté, who was a big man just like my dad, weighed about 240 pounds. And they went into that, that, that club, that dance hall, and they said, you stay out here and count the people that we're going to throw out. I counted 28 people. At 14, I was uh, six foot one and weighed uh, 185 pounds. And, but I still had it in mind that I was going to be a professional wrestler. I, my, my brother was already a professional wrestler then. And, but I was afraid that I wouldn't be big enough. But by the time I wrestled for the Canadian Championship in Regina, Saskatchewan in 19, uh, 1957, I, I won a silver medal representing the province of Quebec. When I won the silver medal, I talked to my brother on the phone who was in, uh, wrestling in Texas. He said, that's enough. I, amateur stuff. He says, you're never going to make money uh, wrestling amateur. He says, you're going to turn pro. So I turned pro that summer. We're wrestling against Dory Funk Sr. and another wrestler named Tough Tony. My brother, it's a tag match, so he wrestles for five, six minutes and he says, okay, he comes over and he tags me. He says, all right, come in. And believe it or not, I can't move. I can't move. I, my, my legs are, are, are shaking, my knees, my teeth are clattering, and I, can, I don't know what's happening to me. And my brother said, come on, you, you're, it's your turn. And I just can't come in, I, I, just, I just couldn't do it. So my brother, he's muttering under his breath. So he keeps on wrestling, so he wrestles for another five, six minutes, and he says, are you ready now? So he comes over and he tags me, and I, I still can't come in. So he got mad, he said, he says, if you're not going to come into this ring, he says, I'm going to take you back to the farm tomorrow. So that did it. I step into the ring and I'm still petrified. I'm like this. And the, the guy that I'm wrestling, he sees what's happening to me under his breath. He says, hey, kid. He says, you know, when you leg dive in the amateur, he says, do the same thing. Do the same thing to me. So I said, well, if he's going to tell me to do it, I'm going to do it. I was afraid not to do it because, my, first of all, my brother was going to beat the hell out of me and send me back to the farm. So I leg knived him and my stage fright never came back. 
if I had one idol in the, in the wrestling business, it was my brother. You know? And and let me tell you how he, he got his, his name, for one thing, and, and what made him that way, so consequently what made me this way. He was a great athlete and represented Canada in, in the Olympics in 1948 in London. He also won a gold medal in the British Empire Games. But he was uh, always five foot seven. I've got seven brothers and he's the shortest one of all, but let me tell you, he's the toughest one of all. And they always told him in the wrestling business, they said, well, you can be a professional wrestler if you want to, but it's not like in the amateurs. They said, you're too small. You'll never make money. That's all they had to tell him. He said to himself, I'm gonna prove them wrong. He always had to prove because of, of his size that he was stronger and tougher than anybody else. So he got into the, he got into uh, uh, the ring in uh, Portland, Oregon. And even before the match started, the, the, he attacked the referee, he attacked his opponent before they announced him. And then the, the cops, jumped in and the body slammed the, the, the policeman and hit the referee. There was blood all over the place when he came out of the ring. The, the, the wrestling promoter, Don Owens, he says, you're acting like a mad dog in there. He says, we didn't even ring, ring the bell and already you got blood on everybody else and the name stuck. From then on, he was named Mad Dog. In the wrestling business, my, my brother said, Watch what I do and do what I do. And he says, we'll get along, otherwise you're going back to the farm. So my, my brother would get into fights like this. He'd throw the guy outside of the ring because he, he had something to prove. He'd throw the guy outside, grab a chair, hit him over the head, fight with him. And they'd fight outside. And I've seen him two, three times do this where he'd fight outside the ring, go out the front door and have the whole crowd follow him and fight over cars in the parking lot, come back around the side door and bring the, the, the crowd back into the side door. And so consequently, that was my style of wrestling too. I mean, I, I wanted to be like him. I wrestled Paul Vachon one time. Uh, Paul was towards the end of his career and I was just getting started in mine. And he was one of the meanest toughest old guys I'd ever been in the ring with. I thought, oh my God, I walked out of the, res the ring with new respect for him. By Sean family, you know, uh, it, his sister, his daughters, and his brother, and you know, I love them all, all the Vashans. They're, they're great wrestling family, and uh, my wife Angel's crazy about Paul. She loves him, and I, and I love Paul. I went from Australia to India, from there to Europe, and uh, um, all, the, all those places, I came back four years later. And in the meantime, Mad Dog has acquired that name, M Mad Dog. He says, look, ever since they, I got the name Mad Dog, he says, I've been making nothing but money. He says, we'll call you Paul the Pig. I said, the hell with you, you're not gonna call me Paul the Pig. He says, why not? Look, they call me Mad Dog. He says, could it be worse? I said, I'm not going by Paul the Pig. But he says it has to be something, it has to, it's got to be gory. So anyway, we wound up on, on Butcher. So I, after that, I was called Butcher. <laughs> Toughest match I ever had was a tag match when we actually won the World, a, the AWA, American Wrestling Association World Tag Team title in Kaminsky Park in Chicago in a cage against Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher. And in unison, there's 30,000 people. As you walk into the ring, they, they're chanting in unison, we want blood, we want blood, we want blood. And it just so happened that there was a big cage around us, couldn't get in, couldn't get out, and the, all four wrestlers wound up with blood all over them and everything. We won the, the title that night, and we held it for the longest, longer than anybody else. It, in the history of wrestling, it was three and a half years. The promoter in India, who then was King Kong, he was a, uh, an Hungarian that uh, expatriate, and there's a family there of wrestlers. They were called the Bulu brothers. They were six brothers. They were all descendants uh, of Iman Box, who was the brother of the great Gamma who wrestled for the world championship 
with, with um, Zabisco, and they've been talking about that in India for years and years and years. And they think they're the greatest wrestlers in the world. On the Monday night at that soccer stadium in, in Karachi, I beat one of them guys, one of them brothers, the, 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 the one named Nazim. I remember all their names, but this, this particular one was Nazim, and he never had anybody put a Boston Crab on him, and I beat him with a Boston Crab, otherwise I was gonna break his back, so he gave up. And I look up in the crowd, and I see 55,000 people coming down to the ring. They all want to kill me. What saved me is I saw through the crowd on horseback. They have the military, uh, they, they, they soldiers, they're there for crowd control, and they're on horseback. And they got great big lattes. They, they, it's a big old stick, about four feet long, and they're swinging it and going through the crowd. Um, that's how they got me out of the ring. And so the promoter, he's so happy, the local promoter, his name is Salim Sadiq. He said, we're going to have a return match. I said, the hell with you. I'm never wrestling that guy again because they're gonna, they, these people are going to kill me. He said, no, 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 not with him. Well, how can we have a return match if it's not with He said, you're going to wrestle the, the brother. He said, the bigger brother. So sure enough, I mean, that thing caught on fire. He, he booked the match on Friday and there was 85,000 people there. And that's got to be the greatest thrill of my life. We did crazy things, but at least you could let your kids watch professional wrestling 30, 35 years ago. But, and my daughter, who became uh, 10 times as famous as I am uh, as a wrestler, she made as much money in three years as I did in 32 years. And the, the irony of things is that she would not have been allowed to watch what they do now on TV. It's become a dirty show and, and I don't want to sound like sour grapes, but it, it's disgusting what they've done with the, with, with the sport of wrestling. And they tell the, the wrong story, I think. I mean, I don't want to use this as a podium uh, for, for, for sour grapes, but the, it, we had villains and we had good guys, but in, nowadays in order to be successful, and what you see on TV, you have to be, you have to become the villain. So in other words, according to the story that, they, that they're telling, it's only the villains that, that, that are successful in life. That's the wrong story to tell. You know, people that live longest and the happiest lives are the ones that can turn the page, I've read. And I realized that too, you have to, you have to um, just turn the page and, and carry on and, and sort of block it out. And I think it would have to be um, families, you know, you can't, like I, I've got seven children and I, I never really had, had the opportunity to bring them up. Life is but a collection of memories. And, uh, and people ask me, why were you a wrestler if you didn't, weren't in it for the, for the money? I say, I was in it really for the stories I can tell. And I mean, I can tell a lot of stories. And I suppose that means that I'd like to be remembered for somebody that really wanted to see the world and meet lots of people and be friendly with lots of them. And he did it. It just amazes me how the people um, come to him that say, I remember when I was just a child and my grandmother was on the end of the chair and she was rooting for, uh, for Paul. And everywhere we go, it just amazes me how many people that do remember him and that their lives touched. I, I wasn't in it to, to create a, a, a legacy or become rich or anything. I just. While I was here, I wanted to be happy and I figured that's what would make me happy. And it did, and I'm grateful for that. <laughs>